where I've leaned in as a sales leader is you need a ton at the top of the funnel when you have a leakage problem. Maybe instead of trying to solve for a top of funnel volume problem, we solve for a leakage problem. What percentage of our opportunities are making it to the finish line? What's the size of those deals? Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. All right. Welcome back to our next episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest is a sales expert who we've been trying to talk for a little while now, and I can't wait to pick your brain. She's a skilled leader with over 15 years of revenue experience. Leadership extends beyond just the bottom line and into growth of her teams. And outside of work, she's a proud mom of two girls and an aspiring runner who's proficient in dad jokes. I hope we get some dad jokes. VP of sales and client experience at 3Flow, Deborah Senra. Deborah, so good to have you. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, I'm excited to learn both about the dad jokes and a little bit about kind of your background. But before I learn about you, let's learn from you. In the world of B2B sales, what is the one soft skill that you see creating value and building relation in both relationships and revenue? What's that one soft skill? Uh, I think it is the ability to actually listen. What's that look like in practice? A lot of people say listening. But tell me a little bit more about that. Um, Well, a mentor once told me you can do one of three things at a time. You can listen, you can judge, or you can talk. And I think the old model of selling was, uh, if I'm being generous, you're judging when somebody's talking, meaning you're planning what you're going to say in response as opposed to actively listening. Or if I'm less generous, we incentivize talking just like be charming, charm the pants off of them, talk, talk yourself into a deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the, the soft skill of listening, it's not keeping your mouth shut. That's, that's not what listening is. Listening is actually paying attention to what the person is saying, not trying to plan your response, not trying to win, not trying to make a point, not trying to like figure out why they're wrong and you're right. But like, absorbing what they're saying to you and taking a minute to process it. And the conversation can't be mapped out because you don't know what they're going to say. It's being able to actively listen and respond as opposed to let me tell you all the great things about my product and I'm going to smile and be charming. And so you're going to buy from me. I think that model of selling is dead. And what do you think caused that? You've been, you've been working in the sales environment for quite some time. I'm curious where you think this buildup has come from because everything happens over time. Yeah. And so would love to start there. You've got me really curious now. <laughs> I think it's a lot of things. I think it's, my opinion is it's two, uh, there are two big factors that cause the shift. The first is the proliferation of sales that like in any given day, I get, I don't know, 30 messages from salespeople wanting to sell to me. And I think that volume, we didn't see 30 years ago. And so when somebody, when I'm just constantly being talked at and sold to, it's less that I want you to charm me and I want you to hear me. I want you to understand me. I want you to listen to me. So that's first. The second is, I think it's a shift in our buying personas, that there was this world where everybody who was selling and everybody who was buying looked exactly the same. And like deals were done on a golf course and we could get a beer or smoke a cigar and get a deal across the line. And that like charm of you liking me was really, it was an important differentiator between the other person who was selling to you that like didn't want to go golfing. Mm -hmm. And now I think our buyers are way more diverse and it's caused us, we can't just rely on charm and likeness to get a deal across the line. Uh, You have buyers that want nothing to do with cigar bars and golf courses, and they aren't charmed by you. 
-hmm. they're like what what we consider the archetype of charming is annoying to a lot of people and i think that though there are still buyers who buy on a golf course i'm not saying that's not the case you can't rely on that way of selling anymore and hit really high quotas with diverse buyers that makes a lot of sense now how does that impact the next point, which is how do you hire to succeed in this market then? Uh, well, I have a, a background in hiring and hiring software. So uh, I have a, a ton of opinions on this matter. The first thing is you have to have a hiring plan. And I think a lot of people jump to hiring without doing their homework. So what are you looking for in a candidate? What are the things that make somebody exceptional at the job? What are the soft skills? What are the hard skills? What are the questions you're going to ask to suss out if they have the hard skills and they have the soft skills? And the hard skills are easy. It's uh, recall questions. Have you done this thing before? Tell me about it. The soft skills are harder. And so if I'm looking for something like listening, um, the biggest uh, the biggest thing I use is at the end of an interview, I'll say, do you have any questions for me? And I'm often the fourth or fifth interview they have with my company. And it is really common for people to say, you know, I've talked to four or five people. I think all my questions are answered. Wow. And then I'm like, well, that's not good. <laughs> really? <laughs> You've never met me before. We, you have no questions for me. Um, so that's a big indicator. The second thing is how much talk time I have on the call versus they have. A bad interview, they're talking a lot. A good interview, they get me to talk. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's a good indicator of it. And then also you can tell when someone has planned their answers and it questions are a great example. They'll say, you'll say, do you have any questions for me? And they'll go, yeah. So what do you like best about the company? And I'll respond with a really honest, genuine answer. And they'll go, thanks. What do you think is the biggest benefit of being on the team? And you're like, okay. <laughs> I could say whatever, I could say anything at this point. You're just going to read the next question on your list. You're not listening. You're not, you're, listening. You're not listening at all. And you're filling in a checkbox. And it, it's, it's making me laugh inside because it's paralleling in sales, which I loved what you said earlier. It's about uncovering things about somebody, which is what a discovery call was always intended to be. And what you're saying is like, it, to me, it's just making me flash back to those bad SDR calls too, where you're just like almost answering the form on the website. But in yes. a face-to-face -face conversation, it's so different. The worst is when somebody goes, thank you. And then they move on. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like you're in a movie. Like, like, okay, did I pass that question? Can I uh -huh. Yeah. It's it's interesting. So that means that, that the value now of a listener is, is, and somebody that has that ability to be an active listener, like you were saying, I mean, it takes a lot of focus a lot of self-awareness, a lot of social awareness as well. How do you coach and mentor to that in a, in a larger sales organization? I think soft skills are really hard to coach, candidly. So listening, if somebody is a terrible listener, I think you're really setting yourself up with a disadvantage if you think I can teach that. I think there is a part of listening that's inherent to the person. However, I do believe people, beginner's mindset, people can learn and grow in ways that are awesome, truly AWE awesome. Um, and in my experience, when it comes to soft skills, the way you, the best way of getting somebody to be better at a soft skill is radical candor with a ton of generous assumptions and empathy. That saying to somebody, we just got off that call. I don't think you intended this, but I didn't feel like you were listening to me. And here are some body language indicators and some moments where as I'm not saying you weren't listening, but as a participant, it didn't feel like you were. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think bringing awareness to a soft skill is perhaps the best in a, in a safe environment where they feel respected is perhaps the best way to coach it. Because if you're aware of it, you can adjust versus like, go read this book and be a better listener. No, it doesn't work, yeah, out. It work that way. I, I agree. There was an interesting comment with um, one of our past guests, Kevin, 
He said, Oprah made a comment about every person she interviewed from the most amazing, you know, most successful people in the world. And they all, right after they finished interviewing, they all went to Oprah and said, okay, how did I do? And it makes me think like, one, we should, we should want that and foster that in our companies because that's that feedback that you're looking for. But very often, it's not something that you do in, in your business life and in your profession. Yet the best of the best, that's exactly where they go. It, it, there's, there's something telling there that just runs the same line with what you were sharing. I, uh, I agree. And I had a thought that I was actively listening. So uh, I saw a TED talk that says, if, you're, if a thought comes to you when somebody's talking, let it go. And I let it go and it'll come back to me at this point. <laughs> It's true. It's tough. It, 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 it begs the question, how have you seen this change being like we are right now over video? And I mean, we're only two people. So on a sales call, I think of the seller with eight to 10 to 12 people on a Zoom. How has that dynamic changed? How do you think it impacts what's going on in, in sales motions today? I think um, it is more obvious when somebody is not listening. Mm -hmm. Anyone out there who thinks you're fooling anyone when you're responding to that message or typing that email or read it, whatever, we all know, we all know what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and so to that extent, the bad listeners are easier to spot. Yeah. I also think it is harder to make someone feel listened to. So the absence of being listened to is obvious. The presence of being listened to is harder to establish. Um, I'll be honest, like for me, listening is something that I had to be aware of and it's something that I work on. My, I think I've been successful because there's something about my aura that makes people want to open up to me. I, my husband jokes that I'll like sit down at a restaurant and 10 minutes later, some stranger is like crying about how they hate their kids to me. It's <laughs> just, it it happens all the time. And I, I've used that to my advantage in sales. It is harder to establish that aura over Zoom. And so I find for me personally, I have to use verbal cues to get the person on the other end of the line comfortable that it's a safe space to open up. So I am an inappropriate person by nature. I try to like put a toe there that like people are like, oh, she's quirky. I can be a little quirky. Or I share personal insights about myself to try to create a space where it's like, oh, we're going there. Okay, I could go there. Um, and then I nod or I show my hands in Zoom calls because if you see my hands, you know I'm not typing an email. And so I, I, I'm I'm an Italian. I do this all the time anyways, but uh, <laughs> I find that that helps. So you have to be more conscious of establishing a space where it's obvious that you are listening. It's a good, uh, it's a good kind of, to me, I always feel like when you're, when you're on these, you're, you're on stage to some extent, or you're totally off camera and you're disengaged. You're like a listener and you're not in the meeting or you're truly here, but you, you pull up a good point. It's, it's, not just what you're saying, it's how you're responding. It's your body language. It's your movement. Like over these mediums, it almost seems to be that much more needed and pronounced because otherwise you could just stand like this and someone really like you go monotone and it just totally would change. But that's how most people are on, on a lot of Zoom calls. Like to your point, some of the best people I've talked to, Larry Long Jr., Richard Harris, they have their aura. And I think people have to tap into that. There's maybe a, a secret skill and ability there that we can all all benefit from. I I think so. And I I mean, I'm biased because I'm quirky, but I always find quirky on Zoom to be really effective. I once, before the pandemic, I was interviewing somebody who was in London at the time of the interview. So we were over Zoom and I was asking her questions. And in the middle of the interview, I'd ask a tough question and she'd stand up and like put her hands on her desk and go, what? and then sit down and answer the question. And I have never loved someone more than in that interview. She was so engaged in the conversation. She yeah. was so unapologetically herself um, that I extended her an offer like instantly. If you can be this dynamic and like present mm -hmm. in our conversation over Zoom, you're going to kill it in person. <laughs> 
That's true. And that makes me think like, how do you translate that then over to a commercial relationship? Right. Because I can, I can think of a lot of the people listening to this, this podcast and they're going in an interview. That's great. Like the, all of those things internally, I, like I want those quirkiness. Okay. I have to go talk to a prospect and I have to represent this company, but how do I do that? And do you think hybrid's going to stay? Because you said, oh, if they're, if they're good here, it's going to go back to, to in person. I'm curious. I want to dig into both of those. Um, so for the prospect, I think, especially after the pandemic, mm-hmm. we've all admitted we're humans. In a way, it like sounds so obvious, but mm-hmm. it's crazy to think that four years ago, if my kid ran behind me in a Zoom, Depending on the person I was talking to, they might have said, like, you're so unprofessional. And now there's like, that happens all the time. A cat goes across the screen. It's just like our lives are in our workspace and it's accepted. And so I think when you bring it to a listening is more than just hearing the words that are coming out of somebody else's mouth. It's observing the context that those words are are like entering the universe. It's body language. It's tone of voice. Is their camera on or off? Are they multitasking? And I think you can create those moments by by meeting the human being on the other end of the line and like being authentically yourself, but still trying to match their energy. Mm-hmm. So anybody who talks to me for five minutes will know that like, what is a totally you you can sell to me and you can do it. Mm-hmm. I've dealt with very professional, polished people who maintain. a a level of decorum throughout the whole call. And I can still be myself and like meet their body language and their aura, even if it's over a Zoom call. So I don't know if that's quite answering your question. It's kind of saying magic, go for it. (laughs) I think you just know, but I think you just nailed the best definition of like sales empathy, right? Because everybody says empathy in sales. I hear it but on this podcast. I hear it all the time. I'm not calling out all my guests. I love my guests, but it's it's a trend that is talked about often. But what you just said of meeting somebody like where they are, to me, is that mirroring idea. It's that idea that like we're balanced. We have the same vibe. I'm not coming in too high and, and crazy and, and high energy for someone that's really low or too pushy. And that's where trust can maybe form or where, where good conversation happens, understanding. And I think that's the best. What I got out of that is check great definition of empathy for sales specifically. I think that's right. I think the best, we'll call it empathy builders in sales, are the ones that I'm such a tactile thinker. So you're going to hear a lot of metaphors from me. Is somebody that sees the box that somebody else is living in Mm -hmm. and knows where the corners are and gets somebody to stretch to the corners. You get a very serious person who like, likes a good dad joke to laugh at your dad jokes, they're your friend for life. You get a very quirky person to a moment of vulnerability, friend for life. So like getting them to their, to their edges. Um, Mm -hmm. But that is a hard thing to do. You gotta, you gotta read a room, read a, read a zoom. (laughs) This is true. Very true. So I'm curious in in your past uh, few years or even in the last quarter, what are some of the challenges that your team's faced and, and some of the things that you've been working on that are top of mind? Uh, it has uh, a wide range. So professionally, I think one big challenge is uh, prospecting. Uh-huh. Uh, and I, uh, I, anybody who worked for me five years ago is going to laugh when I say this. Five years ago, I was the person that was like, cold call all day. (laughs) I was never the person that says cold calling is the best way to get meetings and the only way to get meetings. So I was multi-threading. You got to use a multi-channel approach. You've got to be relevant. You've got to show me, you know me for the Sam sales folks out there. Uh But cold calling is the most emotionally challenging thing you're going to do. And doing it every single day builds a, a muscle memory of bravery that's needed to be a good salesperson. So I was all in that that has to be a part of it. I still believe that, but I believe the results of cold calling are dramatically worse than they were five years ago. And so I am navigating this with my team, which is uh, how do you get 
prospects into the pipeline, get that initial conversation when email is just noise, phones, I don't, I can't remember the last time I answered an unknown number on my phone. Yep. Um, LinkedIn is now very noisy. Like the number of LinkedIn messages or LinkedIn influencers I see, it makes me want to vomit. It, what channel is left that's new and interesting? We've been navigating that. Um, so that's a big one professionally. What are some of the cha- channels you're seeing emerge? And what's maybe kind of, you don't have to give me the secret sauce, but but what's some of the channels that, that you're seeing traction or, or what are you going back to that's maybe working? Referrals yeah, are a big one. And uh, it's there are some really cool software solutions in the market now that get me really excited to help you um, maximize and scale referrals. Uh, so I think that's one I'm really excited by. I don't know if somebody has a better answer, come to me where I've leaned in as a sales leader is you need a ton at the top of the funnel. When you have a leakage problem, maybe instead of trying to solve for a top of funnel volume problem, we solve for a leakage problem. What percentage of our opportunities are making it to the finish line? What's the size of those deals? And can I maybe tighten up if, if somebody can only get three demos a week, Whereas five years ago, the goal was five plus. How Mm -hmm. do I make sure they still close the same amount of deals? I think that's where everybody's facing that challenge. There was a statistic. No, I I love what you say because you're calling out what I think is, is like the, I'll call it almost the HubSpot problem. Because I remember reading the book of like, here's the funnel and here's the pipeline. And this is how you just put it together. And it was phenomenal. And it worked. You could turn the incredible machine on and produce content and drive people inbound. And wow, this was awesome. That's not the same as it is today in terms of the volume. And people are not as interested at just, oh, this is new tech. Let me see the new tech, the new shiny thing. They're fatigued by that. And there's a thousand new shiny things. Yeah. So to your point, like increasing win rate, being able to identify like what really matters to your buyers and hone in on that and be more surgical. I think is where it goes. And then going back to your attention, is it brand or is it activity? Is it is it getting somebody in the right moment or is it just getting a big, massive top of funnel and sifting through it? I think there's going to be some major shifts in, in how people go to market in the, in the coming years because of that. I think so too. I was hoping you were going to say, actually, I have this guest that solved this problem for you, but shucks. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep going. So that's for many episodes of B2BQ. Hopefully we can solve that problem because to your point, I think the attention deficit is crazy across all spectrums. I see it on the marketing side, the time on website, the bounce rates, the lack of conversion rates. What do you do with it? At the yeah. same time, hey, you give everything away. That's awesome. But then how do I ever get in touch with this person? You have to wait till they raise their hand. There was a statistic that was once interesting, but also scary as a few years back, it said, I think 5% of your total addressable market is actually in market at any one time. And so then if you think, okay, if, if only 5% is really truly in market at any one time, all those conversion rates make a lot more sense. Yeah. But it gets scary. Yeah. I also am a big believer that the most fundable problems are often the complicated problems. Mm-hmm. And there, the best solutions are the simplest. What is there some principle? And I'm I was big in science in high school, and there's some principle that the most obvious, like the solution, is the most obvious thing that you can't see. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of for buyers. I think we get caught up in the complexity of the problems we're trying to solve. I don't even know to go look for the simple solution. So when somebody introduces simplicity into the complex, that's really helpful. Um, the problem for a lot of us is, especially over the last two years, what has been funded in the B2B SaaS space is not simple solutions. <laughs> so there's just a ton of complicated noise out there. And hopefully you're lucky like me and you're in a, in a company with a great product, but that's not always the case. And so it makes selling even harder. So before we jump into a little bit about yourself, 
how do you break through the noise? What's your hypothesis? I mean, I, it is going to be cliche and you've heard this a million times on your podcast, but reach out to the person, do your homework, make them feel known and seen. The more your email looks like a template, the less likely I am to read it. And if you look at my LinkedIn profile, like the emails that I get, that's like, oh, you went to wash you? That's great. And it's like, okay, you spent two seconds on my LinkedIn profile. I'm not going to take your meeting. But the ones that say, hey, I saw we were connected to the same person. Here's how I know this person. How do you know this person? I also did some research on your business. Here's how I think I can help. Those are the ones that I may respond to, I may not, but I read them. And oftentimes I reach out to the person who sent it and I say, are you looking for a job? <laughs> it goes back to that hiring thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it goes full circle. I love that. There is one episode, actually, you just hit on something. So Ethan uh, Butte from uh, Bomb Bomb. he shared, and it was, I loved this. He said, you know, we are hardwired to say no to the BS and protect ourselves, right? From the fake, from the fake connection, from the fake like authenticity. And so not only would I say, listen to that episode and to our listeners, that was a great one about authenticity and maybe the psychology behind some of these, these observations, but also it's another way, like he was saying, you can't do a mass video and send it to 500 people and expect that to be personalized. Like, no, you need to sit and send that video to Deborah and speak to her. I wish I had a sheet of paper in front of me because I also hate the, hi, Deborah, holding a sheet of paper. That's not personalization. That is not. No, go away. Go away. <laughs> Don't do that. So enough about smashing this part of it. What excites you about the future? Oh, uh, God, it depends on the day. Okay, fair, fair. <laughs> We live in a um, time right now, right? Professionally or personally? You go pick. Uh, I'll give it wide open. Gen Z excites okay. me about the future. Um, I my I don't know what my daughter is going to be. I have a ten year old and an eight year old, and the I don't give an f about your rules for me that I see them and Gen Z embodying. It just mm -hmm. like gives me hope for humanity. When I was 10 years old, I remember like sitting on my bath, the edge of the bathtub and seeing, you know, it's skin. So your thighs mm -hmm. smooshed down and they got wider. And I cried for hours at how fat I was when I was 10 years old. My 10 year old daughter, you know, she is, she's active and fit, but she is a normal 10 year old. She's got a little tummy and this girl wears crop tops and she like poses in the mirror and like somebody could tell her that she shouldn't like you're you shouldn't be wearing a crop top and she'd be like okay my body my choice and it just like it she's just not impacted the same way i was and i see that with her but also gen z in the workplace they hold us us old people <laughs> great hairs they don't need to justify their expectations for us. Yeah. Like I'm expecting this of you, do it or not. I don't need to justify my expectations. And there are moments when that can be annoying, but there's also like, damn straight. Yeah, there's an, there's an accountability. And, uh, and I think uh, you, you hit it on the head. I have five nieces that are all kind of going through that age range. And uh, there's something about just their want to do it themselves and do it their way. And, and, very honestly, a lot of observation and a lot of learnings from other generations behind them that they're saying, whoa, time out. I'm not going this direction. That's stupid, mom. <laughs> <laughs> a little obstinate, but a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. So for the next generation. And so you think, you know, the statistic was 44% of millennials are never going to want to talk to sales or don't right now want to talk to sales. What's Gen Z going to be? Do you have any, uh, any guesses? My guess would be maybe they're more willing to talk, but less likely to put up with the BS. Like the, oh, I like that observation. Um, I had a one of the best sales reps that ever worked for me had a pet passion for taxidermy, and oh. she was like, 
crazy interesting and really good. And I think part of it was because she was so, she was just interesting mm-hmm. that I think like she got people, you know, she had like this like stuffed porcupine behind her. It was like a great conversation starter and it was dressed yeah. in like Victorian garb and she would like take it down. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. I want to be on some of those Zoom calls for sure. Yeah. So That's great. So Deborah, before we part ways, I would love to learn a little bit about you. Tell me kind of where you grew up, your past, what got you to where you are today? Just all of it. All of it. Tell me a little bit about Deborah. Uh, well, I was born in San Francisco, but grew up in Minnesota. Okay. My father, it was, this is actually interesting. It's not about me. It's about him. My father was born in Northern Italy in a town so far North, they spoke German and he was born there because his father and his mother were Holocaust survivors, went back to their towns after going to the camps. It was very anti-Semitic. And so they were trying to get to Israel and made it to Italy. And that's where my dad was born. Mm -hmm. Um, It's for me, I just recently learned that he considers himself Italian. And he's like, well, I was born in Italy and I was born in America and nobody born in America says they're American. They're like, oh, my seventh generation grandfather was Irish. So I'm Irish. Yes. So you know, tangent, but that's an interesting fact about me is I'm first generation American on my dad's side. And depending on who you ask, I'm Italian, Polish, Hungarian, French, or Swedish, <laughs> whichever, wherever you want to land. Um, <laughs> what else? I don't know. I got two kids. I love my husband. Mm-hmm. Uh, three years ago, I couldn't run for 30 seconds without uh, stopping. Cause I mm-hmm. have this like weird disease that makes my legs itch when my capillaries open and in COVID, I just needed to get the hell out of my house. And so I did a half marathon and now I run every day and love it. And it's wow. a matter of life. So <laughs> what a transformation. That's tremendous. Yeah. So, so I'm curious, a little retrospective, if you were to take yourself back in time, just after graduating, right. You were at uh, Washington university. And yep. 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 Okay. What advice would you give yourself? Never ask a question you don't want the answer to. (laughs) Okay. Okay. No, I think life between college and now hasn't been a hundred percent easy and I've definitely made mistakes, but I kind of wouldn't give myself advice because like, then I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Go live it. Go do it. You like where you're in well, Deborah, where can people connect with you? And um, also, I will really want you to tell me a little bit about what you're doing today and, and the company you're with and uh, just where they can find you. Sure. Um, so I'm the head of sales and client experience at a company called 3Flow. It's an insurance tech platform for the insurance benefit, uh, employee benefits industry. Mm-hmm. And you can find me at Deborah Senra at 3Flow.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn, but depending on my mood... Uh, and what you write in your invite request, I'll decline you or accept you. So, but, you know, et cetera. It, LinkedIn is annoying these days. So, <laughs> well, they, they've got a lot of material on this podcast if they listen, right? That's the that's the lesson to come out of it. There you go. Oh, yeah, mass spam. Okay, Deborah, thank you so much for joining me. It's been quite a fun time talking to you on this episode of B two B EQ. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, to our audience, until next time, you can listen in where podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, I'm Tim Harris, and this is B2B EQ. Have a good one. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.